Angeles and his wife, Amanda. I just want to give, recognize her, and I got tongue twisted, but she's on the front. Uh, so we, we welcome them tonight, and we're just going to dive right into this. So if you will, just bow your heads, and we'll uh, begin in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to come together. I thank you for these brothers who uh, join uh, their labor in the faith with us. And God, that we are just pressing in this hour in which we're up on this earth. This is our time, Lord. This is the time that you've appointed us, the time that you've given us. And we just see the darkness upon the land. Mm. And our, our hearts are to be the light, to be a beacon, a lighthouse. And Father, one of the things that we want to talk about tonight or the subject tonight is the rapture of the church. And it's something that I think that has kind of got pushed aside. So Holy Spirit, we just, uh, we're praying that Holy Spirit will have his way tonight, that we could just uh, resonate within those that are watching and those that are here, that they could understand the severity of it and the importance of it. And Father, we just thank you tonight that uh, you're blessing those that are here. We just, any ones that would have had a request, we lift that up, you know, our hearts, our minds. And we just ask now you be with us in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 Okay, uh, I'm going to begin tonight, just kind of do a little intro, and then what our plans are with the panel and why we have a panel. The first half, the first half of the section tonight, segment tonight, is uh, we have each of these guys representing one of the uh, theories or theologies about the rapture. Uh, Stephen uh, is going to cover uh, pre-trib. And then uh, Martin is going to cover mid-trip. And then uh, Josh is going to cover post-trip. Now, you don't know what that means because through the, uh, through the teachings of the doctrines of the church, you know, it's not that anybody who's a follower of Christ doesn't believe that Christ is coming again. Mm -hmm. But there's some things that they, they don't follow exactly the scripture, and we'll explain to you why. It's easy to see why people get confused. First is, is that the second coming of Jesus is not the rapture. So when you study the first and second coming of Jesus, you're actually studying the first coming as to when he came as a babe. And that was his role as a priest. And I'll explain that tonight. And then his second coming will be when his feet sits down again upon the earth. Uh, and it'll be in Jerusalem and he comes as a king. Now, what we're talking about is the timeline between Christ's priesthood and his kingship. There's an event that will take place, and it's obviously going to be latter in the time period between those two called the rapture. Now, the Bible does not have the word rapture in it. For those of you that want to get technical, uh, you can take it up with my panel because I'm not the guy you want to get technical with. <laughs> but, but it is taken, it's a Latin word taken from the term, that, which is in the Bible, and we're going to cover that, the catching away. Mm -hmm. So it's not a misrepresentation, <clears throat> just a translation. And so I'm going to begin tonight with the scripture, if you want to follow with me, in Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to read uh, verse 11, and then I'm just going to go uh, through some things here real quick, and then we're going to open up to the panel. Which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up in heaven? This same Jesus, and that's important. Remember that, this same Jesus. So, so we know his first coming, he was a savior. His first coming, he was a priest. So before he transitions into another title, which we'll talk about, he has to come. Okay, And it says, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, like matter is one thing that I'm going to be talking about over the next few weeks. I think my mic is sinking on me. Hang on. Seems like I keep leaning over more and more. Okay. <laughs> now, basically what the angels are saying here, because they watched his ascension. Okay. This was not a vision. This was a factual, actual event that took place that they watched Jesus to be ascending into the clouds. Now, the phrase in like matter and same Jesus is talking about here is the fact that his, his role that he was playing at the time. So in, in John 14, 3, we're not going to read it, but Jesus said, I will come again. So we see that in the last time that Jesus, you know, was known to everybody in his rejection as the Messiah. And so in that rejection, there was a time where uh, the church, you know, had rejected him too, or the early religious crowd, I shouldn't say the church. 
but the last time that they saw him was as a rejected Christ. So I want you to think about that for a moment because how was he seen the last time he was seen? It depends on what category of person that you were in is how you saw him. Some saw him as being rejected and just that's why he's called just a prophet. The last time the church saw him, they saw him taken up in the clouds. The last time the disciples saw him was on the Mount of Olives. So see, it, there, there's different segments of time when people saw him for the last time here. And then, so anyone, it, the Bible is telling us that the next time anyone sees Jesus on this earth is him descending as a bridegroom. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for the descension of the one who ascended in the like matter and in the same Jesus that left. Okay, so so there, that's important because as we get forward here and talk about in the book of Revelation, you're going to understand that Jesus' title, he takes on another title at the end of the chapter 5 in the book of Revelation because the seals need to be opened. And there's no one in heaven to open them. So when they ask for, and John, you know, he, he's literally weeping because who's going to open them? Mm -hmm. Well, they call forth uh, the Lamb of God. But at that point, he now is titled <coughs> the Lord. So before the seals are open, he has to come back for the church because he wouldn't be the same Jesus if he took on That's the good. title Lord. Okay, so this is what we're going to break this down for you. And I don't want to get too complicated with it. I like keeping things simple. Now, like I said, we don't want to confuse the second coming with the rapture. There are two different events, okay? Now, the second coming uh, is, is going to fulfill his second role. When Jesus does come the second time and his foot sits down, he'll be a king. He's a priest right now. He's making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. He left as a priest lamb. He will return as a lamb, priest, king. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to see in the when Jesus returns to earth the same Jesus you see him go up. Right. Not going to be your savior. Right. Yeah, you know, he's going to he's going to be eyes of fire. Amen. And he, you know, he he's going to be uh, on a whole different Jesus. Now I say that when I say uh, fulfilling a different uh, duty. Okay, it's the same Jesus in that role. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to open up to the panel here. What, how did we get to where we are? How did the church become so divided on the fact that some people, as I believe, you know, if you want to classify me, I'm a, I'm a pre-trip, I guess. If you want to stamp me with something, I just call me all trip because you have to be ready all the time. But, <laughs> That's good. But, <laughs> all trip. That's good. But, you know, if, if because... There's so many things in the Bible that would not make sense and does not place that we'll talk about over the next couple of weeks that would not fit if we did not, if he did not come for the church before. OK, so we're going to go to, to, to Pastor Stephen and we're going to talk about a little bit of the history. And then after about you know the first segment, half of this segment, we're all going to jump on the uh, talking about uh, the pre-trib because everybody up here <coughs> believes and pre-trib. Okay, I didn't go out and find people who believe differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Steve. Amen, brother. Yeah. yeah, I told, I told uh, Pastor Martin and Josh I was going to screen grab some of their points about mid and post-trib and try to catch them up. <laughs> um, but what Pastor he said was. is how we how we got to this point, um, I think is, is a really good topic. And I love that he started out in Acts um, because I think one of the biggest problems we have in the body of Christ is that when it comes down to disagreements, whether doctrinally or theology, a lot of this, and pastor says it best, and he says it's not a bad word, so I'll say it, it comes down to ignorance. And the reason it's ignorance <clears throat> is because we don't study the Bible in a methodical way, which means we don't study it from front to back. And what we do, a lot of the churches, what they do is they key in on small sections of the Bible, isolated from the rest of scriptures, and then they just try to make a, a complete theology based upon a small section and not based upon the entire Bible. So it's kind of like, I don't know if anybody's ever heard the, it's like an old Indian poem about the six blind mice, uh, six blind mice, the six blind men. Three blind mice, three blind mice. Yeah, we heard that, Pastor Zoo, yeah. I'd love to see how I could tie that into the rapture. 
No, I'm sure you can. Well, you probably could. But yeah. three, we're not even gonna try. Um, but the six blind men that are around an elephant. Has anybody ever heard that poem before? Okay. So you have six blind men that go to an elephant and they're they're trying to figure out what kind of animal this is. Right. So one has their hand on the leg and one has his hand on the trunk and one has his hand on the on the tail. You know, one thinks, well, this is a rope because they're holding on to the tail. And one thinks it's, you know, something else because they're holding on to the trunk. So what they don't know is they're only holding on a small section of that animal. So when studying scripture, when studying something like the rapture, when studying something very important, you have to look at it from Genesis to Revelation. You have to study everything because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It all weaves together. We just have to make sure that we're studying the entire thing. So a couple of things that I want to talk about real quick uh, before I dive into four reasons, uh, at least I believe we should be pre-trib, is prophecy does two things. One, it either warns you, it scares you, or two, it comforts you. And the difference in, in how you respond to that is what's in here. So the rapture being prophetic, if it scares you, then there's something in here that we need to work out. If it comforts you, knowing that your Jesus is coming back for you, yeah, then good. you have a good Come revelation. On. Amen? So yeah, understanding yeah. that how you respond, and, and, and I just take that nugget away when you're reading through Scripture, when you're studying Scripture and you're reading prophecies, if it's scaring you, then you need to pray in that moment and say, Lord, what is in here? Why am I scared? Why am I feeling whether conviction? What is that? Search my heart, create in me a clean heart, you know, renew a right spirit within me and try to understand what it is because they should be comforting when you're on the winning side. Amen. All right. So the four biblical reasons, the first one is believers are promised to be kept from the hour of testing that is about to come on the whole earth. So that's in Revelation 3, 10. If you have that, write it down. The second one is Christians are promised not to face God's wrath ever on earth or in eternity because Christ bore it on the cross once and for all for their behalf. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.9. If you write that down. I'll go slow, sorry. Can you do that three blind men again? Three blind mice? Three blind mice. That's our waiting. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I'll wait for Kylie's hand to lift that's off. That's the remix version. Uh, yeah, that's the. Good. The third one is Christ appearing is a blessed hope for believers. So Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. So again, it's a blessed hope for his appearing. And then the fourth one, the bride of Christ, which is the believing church of Jesus, is depicted as the marriage supper of the land before Christ makes his descent to earth at a later time. So understanding those four, that's Revelations 19.7. Understanding those four things, we can have an understanding that there will be a rapture, which then starts the seven years. So there's a, a rapture, which is what Pastor alluded to, where Jesus puts his foot down, and that begins the seven-year tribulation. About that three and a half years of that seven, that's when you'll see the rising of the Antichrist, the ministry of the two witnesses, which there's a lot of debate on who those are. Uh, personally, I believe it's Enoch and Elisha. I, we could probably talk about that. It may be a good conversation. Um, and then that second three and a half years is what some people refer to as the Great Tribulation. So we're all on that. The last part I have here, and then I'll kick it over to probably, I think, Martin's mid when speaking to someone, because you're going to come across this, when you're talking to people about things um, like the rapture or anything, what you need to, to do is keep in mind what I said is, is taking it from, from Genesis to, to Revelation, but also breaking it down some key words, like ask him, what is the day of the Lord? What is the trumpet Paul's talking about? What does God's wrath mean? When you ask those questions to people and they start breaking down those things, they'll come to the conclusion that there is pre-trib. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'll pass over to Pastor Martin then for, he's explaining. Just let me say real quick before we start on mid-trib. Now, does everybody, you know, if you're totally confused, raise your hand and I'll try to, to address something here. But the pre-trib that, that uh, Pastor Stephen described, and I know it's hard to do that, you know, to try to in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. But it's because 
we don't see the wrath. Mm-hmm. And it's because Jesus comes in the air. He doesn't touch the ground. Right. And, and so that we are the kings and priests that go to the Burma seat. Okay? Right. Now, the Burma seat, Paul took from the Greeks whenever they had the Olympics. So whenever the Burma seat means that you come to receive your rewards of how you did in the contest. Mm -hmm. A lot of modern church today doesn't want to talk about rewards. They don't believe Mm -hmm. in rewards or they shy away from it. Right. But you are given crowns uh, as you are rewarded as your work on the earth. So if you think it doesn't matter uh, how well you live your life for Christ, right. you're going to find out a rude awakening when you get to the Burma seat. Right. Because you right. don't sit on the sideline and win a crown. That's right. one. Okay, now we're going to find out how the doctrines of the mid-trib, so that means the 42 weeks, seven-year period, is some people believe Christ will not rapture the church, not come again, but rapture the church to 42 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> uh let me let me say this just as a disclaimer then yeah i thought this was like a, a setup <laughs> like a like a testing of whether or not i study the scripture because when i was told hey martin you got midriff i'm like you give me one of the most complicated <laughs> but mainly mainly one of the most widely debated parts of the yeah. pre-trip mid-trip post-trip conversations is Mm mid-trip so if anybody who knows me everything that i'm going to tell you is it's going to be backed biblically um and i think that's how every you'll see that as a theme of conversation um so mid-trip just so we understand what that is it is a period in the tribulation timeline that centers around events midway through um the seven year tribulation period. Um, so I'm just gonna hit on a few points and I'm gonna share some scripture. And again, we just have a limited time, so I don't have time to expound on this the way that, you know, I, I want to, but hopefully over the weeks, Pastor will kind of extract it more. But Daniel chapter nine is where I'm gonna start. And I'm gonna start in verse 27. And it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice of the ablation to cease. And for the overspreading of uh, abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So number one thing I want to talk about in this time is the abomination of the desolation. Um, it's a significant prophetic event that Daniel talked about. And it involves the Antichrist breaking a covenant and desecrating the temple. Mm -hmm. So when you read that whole chapter, you're kind of going to see those two themes. Um, Another scripture I will say is Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And it says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the ammunition uh, that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, one of the key events of the mid-tribulation that you are going to know that is happening biblically is that there's going to be a great significant prophetic event, which is the Antichrist is breaking the covenant, and there's going to be a desecrating of the temple. Mm -hmm. So then the second or to lead into that is the rise of the Antichrist, which is the pinnacle of this mid-trip. This is kind of where the foundation of this is. So the Antichrist will reveal his true identity and true nature and begin a period of persecution against every believer that re- that's on earth. Let me say this. I believe that the Antichrist is being groomed currently. I believe that they, again, the Bible supports that. It also supports that the Antichrist is not going to be in the United States. They are going to come out of the eastern regions of the world. Okay, so again, that's just biblically, again, people say, (laughs) I don't even get it, presidents and 
talk show host and <laughs> what talk show host? Somebody said Oprah was the Antichrist. <laughs> Well, have a spirit of Antichrist. But but understand, biblically, the Antichrist is coming out of the eastern region of the yeah, world. Mm-hmm. Right. And I believe they are being groomed right now. Yeah. Okay. So second Thessalonians uh Thessalonians pastor alluded to this, chapter two, verse three and four. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of the lawlessness is revealed. Who was that man? The Antichrist. Mm-hmm. The man doomed to destruction. It goes on to say he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Okay. So that's, again, I'm just giving you a snapshot. Next is the persecution of the saints. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, 13. Through 17, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who gave who had given birth to the male child. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So who's the dragon? Satan. Satan is the dragon. Who was the mother? Israel. Who's the offspring? The church. The church, believers. So. Three for three. three <laughs> good job, Pastor. We got a winner. <laughs> <laughs> you win the Mitch Trevor Award. <laughs> no thanks. Now, no thanks. when you read that in Revelation, that is critical to understanding the events that unfolds in the mid trip conversation. The dragon's going to arise. And when he arises, he's going to have one purpose. That's to get back to at Israel, and by doing that, he's going to get after every believer that believes in the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's how you're going to know, and you're already starting to see that. So again, we're not that far off of what's about to become Mm -hmm. on a national scale of what's going to happen to Israel and those that believe in her or in Israel. Okay? So then next, I want to talk about the two witnesses. Pastor Stephen alluded to this. Um, I have my own beliefs of who the two witnesses are. Oh, this is good. We Let's got a debate him. going on. Mm. Who you got? I do believe one of them is Elisha. Um, but I, I have I since believed that the other one could be. Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson. Moses. If he's a witness, <laughs> I'm really going to have to look at the man in the mirror. You <laughs> do yeah, that. Where's Corey when you need him? <laughs> yeah, Corey could have. <laughs> but I, I do believe one is Elisha, and for some reason, I, I believe one could be for me, Moses. Right. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people believe. Now that. again, that's 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 Martin. Mm-hmm. The well, Bible those, does not. Those re- were the two that was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that's why right. I said those could be the two. You mm-hmm. know, but I do believe Elisha was one, and that, that's based on how he went to heaven. But I do think the other one personally could be Moses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the Bible speaks very vividly of two witnesses. Um, Revelation chapter 11. But first, the two witnesses were prophesied for 1,260 days, which is in the first three and a half years. Mm -hmm. The pastor talked about the second, and they're performing miracles, they're preaching repentance. So they're still performing um, miracles, they're still doing the very things that we could very well see today. But you're going to know them because the only thing they're going to be talking about is turn to God. Turn to God. Turn to God. Mm-hmm. I think there was a series called Left Behind. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, I, there's a lot of discrepancies with that series. I'm not, there's some things that they do well, there's other things, that's with anything. But they did a very somewhat good job of really representing the two witnesses in that series. Because the only thing those two characters did was that's all they did. Biblically, for 1,260 days, they were performing miracles, but they were trying to bring people back to Christ. Mm-hmm. And that was what their goal was. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 through 6, and says, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devour their enemy. This is how anyone who wants to hurt them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens 
and that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters and the blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. That scripture is why I said Moses could have been one of them. Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I'm back in my element. Mm -hmm. That's a personal thing. Yeah. But that's your two. I got uh, a few more, and then I give it back to Pastor Danny. Death and resurrection. Um, at the end of their ministry, the two witnesses' ministry, the two witnesses will be killed by the beast, but will be resurrected and ascended to heaven. The beast is on the earth, it will be the Antichrist. He's going to kill them, and God's going to make a public demonstration out of their death. By showing they are doing my work during this time of terroristic stuff on the earth, I'm going to raise it and they ascend to heaven. Revelations 11. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those that saw them. And they that heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Last thing I want to jump to is that there's, there was a war in heaven. I want to jump to the, the seventh trumpet. And this is the last thing I will say about my little time here. This is where the kingdom becomes proclaimed during this mid-tribulation period. The seventh trumpet sounds, and that's harrowing the ultimate establishment of God's kingdom. This is when God's about to literally do what he what we all should really look forward to as Christians, he's getting ready to put his foot down, literally. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Seven is, is the number of what? Completion. Completion. Yes. At this point, God said, I've seen enough. It's time for me, like Pastor said, I need to make my appearance now. Mm. Here's how you know. And there was a loud voice in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. At this point, the mid-tribulation period, biblically, is now closed up, and now God, Jesus form, steps foot back on earth, and now he reigns forever. Mm -hmm. Now again, to kind of allude, if you say, well, Mark, what do you believe? I'm like, I believe in all of it, but I am a pre-trib person. But when I read my Bible, I have reason to believe in mid-trip because everything I just read to you is going to happen during that seven-year period, either in the first three and a half years or in the second three and a half years. So, Okay. Well, let me just iterate on that a little bit because the, the, the problem I have with mid-trip, okay, is number one, if, if it was mid-trib rapture, we could nail the exact moment it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because whenever uh, the temple gets desecrated and the Antichrist gets recognized. Now, there's going to be an unholy trinity. You see, see just like there's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's right. going to be the Antichrist, uh, the beast, and the false prophet. So you got to you got to work in who's doing what here, okay? So, so. These two guys are being formed in the first three and a half years. The first three and a half years are going to be good for some people, but bad for others. Kind of like what's going on in the earth now. If you're in the know, you can make a lot of money right now. If you're in the know, uh, you, you can do some things. But for some people, it's a time of suffering. You know, mm -hmm. things are falling apart. And so this is how it's going to escalate in the tribulation period. But the thing that starts the tribulation is not the rapture. And I just want to hit this real quick because some people think that starts the time clock. The thing that starts the tribulation period is the signing of the peace treaty. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. will be a seven-year peace treaty. Right. That starts the clock. The rapture can happen any time between now yeah. and then. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe it will be close to, the, to right. the signing of the treaty because the reason I believe that is because that that – we're going to see some things. The, the, the rapture is not an escape plan. Right. Amen. It, you know, I follow finances. And and right now, there's some things that's going on in the world you need to know about. And maybe I can get into this. Because they're literally, right now, and it's not Bitcoin, and it's not crypto dollar. There's another currency, another Embridge. system, Embridge, thank you, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that is going to rule the world. 
and, and they're going to absorb everything else. And this thing is already created. Uh, it's already in play and it will work. It's the first yeah. one I've seen. And well, it's a, it's a hybrid yes. of, of crypto and like blockchain currency. So it's a, yes. it's a mix. <laughs> so, so I am pre-trib too. And I believe that the mid-trib is they're confusing with major events that have to unfold to the second half of tribulation is, is literally the pouring out of the bowls and the judgments. Now, there's some people who believe in post-trib. Uh, we, like were, we were going to talk about that, but since these two guys took so, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Josh Davis, tell us about post. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm going to have to just um, periodically stop and say I'm pre-trib <laughs> because if I don't, Stephen is going to clip this and post it on my. my I got Facebook the last part where Martin said biblically I'm mid-trib. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it was Stephen mentioned a while ago. Um, uh, he was talking about the the lack of understanding. It may have been pastor, um, and and that's really where the the idea of post trib belief comes from. Is it's, it's not. Uh, I know uh, with Martin going over the mid trib belief, it's more of a confusion on what scripture says. But post trib really comes from uh, just a lack of scripture, uh, right. and and. With that, people even throw out. I, I mean, I can't even pretend to be post-trib because it would mean I would have to deny so much scripture. Um, the idea really got started uh, it, more recently than any of the other beliefs. Uh, and, and a post-trib person, uh, some of them even claim they don't believe in a rapture at all. Yeah. Um, and th they believe what's going to happen is that when Jesus makes his return, they don't, they don't put a separation in the events. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe the return of Christ and the catching away is the same moment. And it's like the bride takes one giant jump that into trampoline. the air and comes right back down immediately with Christ. That's, that's what, what the belief is in a nutshell. Um, and, and they get this idea that rapture is a new thing, a new teaching, uh, because they believe that it come from uh, John Nelson Darby in 1800s. Uh, and where they get this idea is in 1830, um, John Darby was really the guy who kind of solidified uh, us using the word rapture in English teaching. And it wasn't that he come up with a new idea, but it was just simply the fact that he could read Latin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people often credit the pre-trib rapture notion to St. Jerome in the 1800s, but uh, that's not the case. St. Jerome actually translated the scripture into the Latin uh, Vulgate Bible uh, in between three, 383 A.D. and 404 A.D., and that's where we get the word uh, rapio, uh, which is where our English word rapture comes from. Uh, but a, a, a post-tribulationist, they'll look at scriptures uh, like Daniel chapter 7. Uh, it says in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 21, it says, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints. Now, if you back up and you begin to read in this scripture, you'll find out Daniel is referring to the little horn that rises up out of the others, which is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And he says, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. It goes on to say, until the ancient of days come and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the same time that the saints possess the kingdom. Um, so they would kind of stop right there and they would say, well, that shows you uh, there's, there's where our uh, tribulation comes from there. But uh, like Pastor was just saying, you know, we are going to see some things. That's right. even Jesus tells us that we're going to see the beginning of sorrows. That there, there are things, but we have to understand that uh, wrath is different. Uh, a post-tribulationist would say they would look at the wrath in Revelation, um, and they would say that all throughout the Book of Revelation, the wrath is the same. Uh, but when you get into uh, get into the the actual language, you'll find out that John, after chapter four of Revelation, even when he talks about uh, things like saints and and uh, elders and things, he begins to use different language mm -hmm. uh, in the original Greek. He's not referring to the church anymore. 
uh, until you get over to Revelation 19. Right. And he begins to speak about the saints again in the same language that he does in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, but post-trib believers will tell you that what Revelation tells us, if we flip over into uh, the book of Revelation and we look at uh, Revelation 13, uh, and this again, John is seeing something very similar to what Daniel saw. Mm -hmm. And so he he then uh, tells us that he's seen that verse it's a verse starting at verse 2. Uh, it says, uh, Revelation 13, starting at verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the feet of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. And, great authority. and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. They worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue forty and two months. And he opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Uh, but when he's talking about saints here, it's a different word in the Greek than what he used in the first few chapters right. of Revelation. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even uh, it's not even a word that translates into uh, what we would the other word we would translate into church, it's actually something that uh, could just be translated into the word holy. And so what it's saying is that this beast or uh, that's been given the power will begin to speak blasphemy, blasphemies against God and have the power to make war against things that are holy. Mm -hmm. And and we, we already see a start yeah. uh, of, of there's war against holy things all yeah, the time. Right. I mean, people are, are all against the church. Um, and then I got one more scripture I want to share in Matthew 24. And, and this is uh, at least the argument that I have often heard. I even had somebody tell me, they, they quoted Matthew 24 and told me I was going to hell because I believe in pre-trib rapture. There you go. I am pre-trib, Stephen. Yeah. Pre-trib. <laughs> wow. But they told me I was going to hell because I believe in pre-trib. Wow. And I think where this, the, what I'm getting ready to read here, where this misconception comes from is, is, a lack of knowledge, again, because people don't understand what the synoptic Gospels are. Yeah. They don't understand that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they were giving their uh, accounts of the things that Jesus spoke of, they don't write down the exact same things, but they record the, the, the events in similar detail. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people who just would rather just take a few scriptures at surface level, they wouldn't understand that uh, we could look at Matthew 24, but we could also look at Luke 21. Right. Uh, and and so if you look at Matthew 24 and you start at uh, verse 21, Jesus says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. And Jesus goes on to continue speaking about things that's going to happen um, in great tribulation. But if you if you dive into Matthew 24 and you begin to study it out, you'll see that the way that Matthew records this is Jesus isn't speaking on a timeline scale, mm -hmm. uh, one thing right after another. He's actually going back and forth between uh, different events of the end of days. And when you uh, get on over into verse 29, it says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days mm -hmm. shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And 
then shall the, the appear, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So what, uh, what post-trib believers do is they like to take these few verses and they kind of mesh them together uh, into this idea that tells us, well, that tells me tribulation is going to be over before I ever get to yeah. see Jesus come back. Right. Tri tri we're going to go through tribulation. And we have to understand that the tribulations that the church sees are different than the great tribulation. Uh, and we, 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 we know that there are distinctions that Scripture makes between wrath and God's wrath being poured out. Yeah. Uh, and one last point I'll make before I turn it back over to Pastor. Uh, another reason you have so many believers in this post-trib idea is uh, they say that uh, belief in a pre-trib is escapism. And uh, I don't care. People can call it escapism. They can call it what they want to. I mean, Jesus said in Luke 21, pray you're found worthy to escape. So, I mean... Well. I'm escaping. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else. Well, it says we're not appointed to wrath. Yes, we're not appointed to wrath. Yep. Now we can experience judgment, but not wrath. Exactly. Right. And which is the point I was getting ready to make because they'll look at the Old Testament and they'll talk about how there's uh, all these times we see people going through and they'll call it wrath. But it's not wrath. It's judgment. Right. When wrath is poured out, we always see that God has provided a way of escape, yep. such as he did with Noah yep, right. and his family yep. on the ark. When wrath comes, there's always escape. Yes. But when judgment comes, God has to uphold his word. Yes, okay, go yes, ahead. Sir. Okay, good point, because it rains upon the just and, the, and the unjust. See, everybody <laughs> suffers judgment, not everybody suffers wrath. Yep. Okay, uh, now that we've got two converts on the stage, <laughs> we're, we're, we're all going to uh, convert them from mid-trip and post-trip. I'm just, I'm just having fun. Uh, I wanted them to specify right at the beginning, you know, they were asked to do this uh, because we just wanted to get that out of the way first because I don't want to get in the middle of this study and then somebody goes, well, what if it don't happen until then? So mm -hmm. I think we've laid some good foundation, and I thank you guys for going out of your comfort zone because it would be hard to teach on something you don't believe. So – I'm going to pick up, and then everybody's welcome to just jump in here, but I'm going to pick up in Matthew 24, since that's where Josh left us. Let's go to verse uh, 3, okay? And Jesus has just prophesied to the disciples, you know, what's going to happen. They're, they're on the Mount of Olives. He's looking over the city. He's telling them what's going to happen. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Okay, now there's three questions here, and this is very important. They're wanting to know when these things will be. He's prophesying the destruction of the temple. It happened at 70 AD. He's, so, he said, and the second question was, what shall be the sign mm -hmm. of that coming? See, we the church, one of the downfalls of the modern church is we follow signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jesus told don't follow signs. All right. He didn't even predict signs of his of of uh, his coming. He said the sign, mm -hmm. these one. Now, I'm not an English major, you know, but but the is one. There's yeah. only one sign, right? That's going to reveal to you when all this stuff is going to happen. Does anybody know what that sign is? It's the fig tree. Mm. Israel, you watch Israel, yep. mm -hmm. and you'll know the sign. It isn't how many tornadoes we have or how many hurricanes we have. <laughs> Isn't how many you know people That's get murdered lot. and how much violence? Those are all things that were going to be. Those were the things that was going to happen. Right. But the sign, and then he goes on to say, after this sign and the end of the world, which that word "world" there translated is age. age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there'll be what things that will happen, which we're seeing. Mm -hmm. There'll be the sign of Israel, which man, you want to get into the sign right there's your sign because mm -hmm. of what's happening, you know. And they're on a time clock now because once they was established as a nation, it wasn't no accident that, you know, uh, four or five years ago that, that they got re, uh, Jerusalem got re, reconnected. I mean, in the midst of all this political chaos and craziness and whatever politician you support, I don't really care uh, because God's in control. Yeah. Amen. That's right. He's That's in right. control. And he's, he, this is all unfolding prophetically. Yeah. So now we're going to drop down just for the sake of time to verse 37. Okay. So in 37, he says, um, 
well, let me just back up to 36 because he says, but of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So this was actually withheld from Christ, our savior, from the angels who has ministered to us. So there's nobody can know, mm -hmm. but yet we continuously, and I say continuously because you may not even know, there's one organization I could name it by name and everybody in this room would know who it was, have predicted the time 14 times and missed all 14 yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. So get away from people who, who are telling you, oh, it's going to happen in this season. It's going to yeah. happen here. Right. They don't know. And the angels that minister to us don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, but he says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was the days of Noah? You know, and that's what I want to finish up tonight just talking about because one of the questions everybody's going to leave here thinking is, okay, I know it's not mid-trib, I know it's not post-trib, but when, how close are we mm -hmm. to the tribulation? Mm -hmm. So in the days of Noah, there was corruption, there was violence. Those things brought forth judgment, mm -hmm. not wrath. See, the wrath, there was judgment led up to the wrath. Mm -hmm. The wrath was the flood, okay? But there was still judgment. They were eating and Gonna drinking. Woes. Yes. Yeah, this is why there's woes, okay? They were eating and drinking, uh, marrying and giving in marriages. None of those things are sin, mm -hmm. okay? But those are things that occupy your time, which causes you to have the inability for the things of God. That's good. Now, I don't want to, you know, pounce on people, but why is it we can have, you know, 200, 250 people on Sunday morning, but we have 40, 50 show up Bible study mm -hmm. and everybody's got their reason. Okay. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but I'm just telling you that is a sign to me that we're preoccupied. Mm -hmm. We don't have time for the things of God. Now watch this. It says that, you know, uh, one of the things that they did was they, there's no mention of church. In right. the days of Noah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's no mention of church. So did they worship? Yes. I can show you in scripture in the book of Genesis chapter four, where it says they called themselves by the name of God. So see, they had a worship, wow. but they only knew right. God as Elohim. They only knew him as the, the one who gave provisions. Mm. So Ooh. this is what's happening in the last days. Yeah. See, we've got people right now who, hey, I know God. He gives me permission. I walk in the name of the Lord, and he, he provides for me. I walk in the name of the Lord. He blesses me. But see, you have to know him. Oh, no, Somebody no. recently, right. that might have been might have been uh, you, Martin, that, that hit on the scripture about that, you know, uh, Jacob and Isaac knew God, but Moses knew the ways of God. Mm -hmm. See, there's a progression. As you go through time, there's a progression in your relationship to God. Yeah. See, and it should be the same with your individual life. Mm -hmm. In your individual life, you should start out knowing, you know, God's a creator. You should, that's, that's child stuff. We teach it to the children, right? Oh. Then you should know him as a savior. Mm -hmm. Then you should know him as one who, what, fills you with the spirit. And you progress through your life as you get to know God in all of his ways. Yeah. So as time went on, the people who knew God early in the scripture had to, they had to step it up a notch and know him. Think about it. Jacob, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, they knew God. Yeah. It says it. Moses knew his ways. Mm -hmm. The disciples knew him in person. Well, David knew him as a king priest. The disciples knew him as a person. Mm -hmm. Now think about this progression. Yeah. We know him after Pentecost as the infilling spirit. Mm -hmm. So why, how mm -hmm. are we supposed to know God in the final days of this earth if we're in the final days? More mm -hmm. intimacy. Right. Right. See, this is, this is where we're missing it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Good. why we're compared to the days of Noah. Now, we, some people watch, watch the churches and I'm not picking on anybody, but you know, I'm not indoctrinated. I'm, I'm not college graduated. Uh, if you look around up here, everybody's got a laptop, but me and I got zip ties. <laughs> um, well, I'm self-taught. <laughs> I strictly let the Holy Spirit teach me and I'm not perfect. Okay. I make mistakes, but here's the thing. He says one of the things that will happen if you, I love the book of Jude. Okay, 
And and the book of Jude says they'll go in the way of Cain. Mm -hmm. What was the way of Cain? This is powerful. Yeah, you know, what was the way of Cain? The way of Cain was no is altar. that he sacrificed, but he didn't have an altar. Oh my God. See, no church. See, COVID wiped out a lot of churches. COVID, and I don't I'm not trying to, you know, start a conversation about COVID, but we're watching a progression of how church attendance, I used this in a message. Beth and I got married in 1978. 70-some percent of people went to church when we got married. I didn't, but 70. Then here we are 46 years later. Now it's only 30%. <clears throat> See, we're, we're showing that we don't need, uh, we don't know God in the way we should, but we know God. But yep. yet the polls show what 80, 90% of people in America say they're Christians. Right. Right? There's a problem here, yeah. right? So we don't know God. We're back to the days of Noah. We don't know God the way we need to know him. Wow. Okay, so the ways of Cain was, I don't have an altar. So think about this. If you don't have a church, you don't have an altar. Yeah. So now I'm going to walk as the ways of Cain. Okay, the ways of Cain was, I'm going to persecute those who have an altar. Mm. That's good. Mm. So, so what's happening right now? You know, all this social media stuff. There's just people in there blasting other Christians. and I mean, boy, what, what, no wonder people, there's no revival. Right. You know, they're just like, they're just, they're, we're fighting amongst ourselves over silly things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now look at the modern church in comparison to this time. Okay. Um, scholars, this ain't me. This is some of the leading scholars that I've studied their material says that they believe that in the days of Noah, that the main teaching was love. Mm. <clears throat> Interesting. That that God was a God of love. Wow. And, and from this uh, uh, love of God, this is why the part of giving and marriage was thrown in there by Christ yeah. or by the scripture. Because see, when God is a God of love and, and whenever there's a giving, a marrying, giving in marriage, then anything... It, it, it's let me put it this way, and this is my words. Okay, it's a love without law. Mm. So when when you have a love, if my wife tells me, Danny, I love you, but she doesn't follow the principles of our marriage, yeah, she doesn't love me. That's a false love. Right, right. That's a lie because my marriage to her has principles, and when we both follow the laws or principles of our marriage then we prove our love for yeah. each other. Mm -hmm. But so go take that to God. So now here I am, I'm coming to God saying, God, I love you. And everybody's preaching the God of love right now. Okay. But guess what? It's a, it's a love without laws. And when there's a love without laws, I don't want no part of it. Mm -hmm. well, and love has become subjective, right? Like your perspective of love may be different than my perspective of love. If I was raised different than you, that I may perceive love as something that it is not. And that's why it's so important. And I know we keep, we hit on this a lot, but this is why the Bible, we talked, Josh and I talked about this with the kids on Sunday. This is your foundation. Love, whatever this says is love is love. It doesn't matter how you were raised or, or who your first girlfriend, all of those things shape your idea of what love is. So you would say, well, if God is such a loving God, then how could he insert whatever? Well, that's your, your, that's a subjective idea of love and love is not subjective because he is a God of love, right? But he, th that is, that is subjective to each person. So again, having those, those biblical principles, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So we understand exactly what it is. And I know we were just talking, we got in here, we were at the church late last night talking about the circles. I mean, the full, the funniest thing he ever said, but it's so true. He said, you know, roundabouts when you drive. He said he saw one with uh, Beth one day, and he's like, man, that's prophetic. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true because circles are everywhere, and we're seeing this full circle, right? Right back into where now the guy that is listening to God speak is looked at as radical, is looked at as extreme. Like, you're really going to build a boat. You're really going to do X, Y, and Z. You're really going to go to church. You're really going to – Yeah. And you're looked at as radical, but you're the one that's going to be saved when the door, when God shuts the door behind. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, yeah, you know, I just want to say uh, when, I, when, when I first, my first few roundabouts, I hated them. 
because I thought, you know, they just, it was a different concept and, you know, and, but now I just like drove them. right through the middle. Now I like them. Yeah. I just run over the media, but I thought, why they put that bump in the road? Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, now I love them because you know why I learned something about a roundabout and I learned this about a roundabout God because see in the throne roundabout, the yeah. throne of God, right? This is why I said they were prophetic. When you're in the roundabout, you have the right of way. Mm. So well, when, teach us, sir. <laughs> everybody uh, else yields to you. I'll just drive around a couple of times. Just show them. <laughs> you know, I, this guy's crazy. <laughs> I'm just like, well, right, get out of my way, man. I got the right of way. All right, I'm excellent. But, you know, when you're in a roundabout with God, you got the right of way. That's good. That's That'll good. preach. All right, guys. You're up. Whew. Anything you want to add to that love thing? <laughs> Anything of that love thing? <laughs> What's love got to do? <laughs> All right, cut the no, life. I, Stick to your this day. One of those three wine eyes, all this stuff. No, I, um, for me, and I, I did a diva on on love that it is one of the most talked about but less performed things yeah. in our world today, mm -hmm. and. I tell my kids this, me and Lauren talk, I, I have never seen Christians that abuse that word so much right, man, right. than I have seen in my young life. For you to say that, I love you, brother, and then go out go the door Come on. and talk about me like, and mm -hmm. I'm not talking about personally, but if we're going to love, that, the same thing with God, I, mean, yeah. I love the Lord. Come on. But you can't tell me the last time you opened your Bible. Come on. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me the last time you've met him at an altar. That's right. That's love without principles. That's, That's love. With, well. you, you've not put parameters or convenience on your love with him. Mm -hmm. That's just lust at that point. At that yeah. point, now you're lusting after what he can do for you. Come on. That's good. That's so good. now there's an exchange. Well, God, if you do this, I'll love you more. Uh -huh. And he's like, I loved you even when you don't. Even when you don't hold up your mm -hmm. end of that self-man-made bargain, yeah. he still loves you. Right. So to me, love, and even talking about the rapture, and as Pastor launches this on Wednesdays, for you to understand, okay, the pre-trib understanding, that's a love relationship. That's, that's why I'm pre-trib. Right. It's love. He died for you because he loved you. He's mm -hmm. coming back for you because he loves you. He calls us the bride of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a love language of relationship. Yeah. So just be cautious in whether it's your marriage, your friendships, your connections, that when you say, Man, I love God. Yeah. Make sure you know what that means Come on. biblically. Right. Because he puts principles on that word because of God is, according to John, God is love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just just I just want to admonish you. Don't throw that four-letter word around because that four-letter word may be a word to you, but it's a covenant to him. That's good. What, no, what no. did you What did you say? Uh, I think it was Friday night, possibly, uh, where you you broke down the difference between love and lust, and that's okay. what was reminding me of when he was okay. speaking. The definition of love is that you exalt another at the expense of yourself. Okay, so that's the definition of love. Definition to lust is you exalt yourself at the expense of another. Come on, man. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that'll preach. Wow. So, so if you say you love me, but yet you're exalting yourself at my expense, you're just lusting after who Dear I am. God. Now, let me before we go to Josh, I just want to say this: Watch what happened in the days of Noah when when love had not principles. Mm. The women went outside the principle of mixing with spirits. Yeah. So what's happening right now? What's the fastest growing thing in America? Does anybody know? Witchcraft. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And so people are like, God loves me so much I can dabble in witchcraft. That's it. God loves me so much I'm, I can be spiritualist but not Holy Spirit. So this is where what we're seeing today. This love without principle is one of the things that I think he was uh, referring to in the days of Noah. And those people got themselves mixing with spirits. If you mm. think that's not going on today, Come on. You, you better get a whole reality. Okay, Josh, you got something? Okay. So um, I, I, w I went to the, the love verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, what it says in the ESV. It says, 
Love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. The, the word envy there, uh, it, it actually comes from the Greek word that's translated into zealous. And the definition of zealous says spending time or energy in support of something that you very strongly believe in. And it gives an example. It says you are a zealous worker, worker enthusiastic and passionate without concern. Mm. So mm -hmm. That's good. When you were talking about a, a love without laws goes totally against God's definition of love that he Amen. gives us in his word. Yeah, and and uh, there's an uh, the, in the NIV it says that love is not proud. What what month are we in? I mean, come on. Lord have Lord mercy. God. That's all everybody's Pride. celebrating right now. Is they're they're so proud that they are zealous in their free love and 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 so it's it's amazing to me to see truly how much we have entered into this it's all about love. It's all about love. Yeah. It's all about love. It's not God. It's a form of godliness. Come on. But there's no power in it. There's no because there's no truth in it. Right. And if there's no truth, then you don't really have God. You've just yeah. got a a stained up mirrored image yeah. of our idea of God. They want the Holy Spirit without the holy. Exactly. They just exactly. want the spirit. That's good. Wait a minute. They just want That's the spirit. Good. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Because it tickles the emotion. That's it. I mean, people love the emotional aspect of, of an outpouring of the Spirit yeah. of God. But, you know, without the holiness, I think it was me and Pastor, we were talking just, it may have been yesterday, about, you know, people have to learn to to make Jesus Lord and not just Savior. Amen. Because they love the idea of being saved. Amen. But they don't like the idea of having somebody Miss governing God. their life under lordship and authority. The yeah. submissiveness of what being under a lordship means. They now, as we wrap this up, I, I want to go back, and I want you guys to comment on this a little bit, but I'm going to go back to, to <laughs> Jesus come the first time as, as uh, a priest. Okay, mm -hmm. a priest is one who offered sacrifices, which in his case he had, to, he had to offer himself. He was the sacrifice. So he had to be the priest to offer himself for our sins. So when he ascended, okay, and they watched him go up, and he ascended, and he went to the right hand of the Father, and he's sitting there making intercession for us right now. Now you gotta you gotta grasp a hold of this because how important this is, and I don't have time to go deep into it, but heaven has a human sitting on the throne. Mm. Mm. So this is this is like mind boggling mm. because you know if people say, Well, how could God care about me? Because there's one of you sitting on the throne. Mm. Mm. He, Come on, he's reminded daily of you. Because his son became flesh. Wow. Teach us, sir. He sets at his right hand. That's good. Now wow. that son is the one who needs a bride because he's missing his part of the angelic beings that got cast out of heaven. Now this is a deeper revelation I'll talk to you yeah. later. But the thing is, is there's a purpose why you're on this earth. Mm -hmm. And he is, he is now fulfilling the priest part of his duty. When his priesthood, it's done. Okay. He's going to step into the kingship, which I told you, I believe is in Revelation chapter five, before the seals are open. When he steps into the kingship, then there is no more intercession. Mm. There is no more Woo. priestly offering. Yes, sir. See, this wow. is why people can't be saved during the tribulation right. period. Wow. Right. Because right. now he's a king. Mm. And, the, and the time period of being saved has passed. Now you can be martyred. Yes. Now there's well, ways that you can still it. enter in, yeah. but you're not wow. going to be born again. Wow. The Holy Spirit's taken off the earth My God. because mm. the Bible even says that the only way that Satan can have full reign is for he to be removed mm -hmm. and he is the Holy Spirit. Yes, so if you think it's hard to walk as a Christian now, I'm, uh, come on. And you try to go through the tribulation, Chris, you ain't yeah. gonna make it. That's yeah. what I mean, because you got no Holy Spirit, uh -huh. you got no power, you got nothing. You're just totally subject to the powers that be. So in this lesson, as we get into this, you know, uh, I, I just want to say, and you guys can jump in here because we got about five minutes. Um, you know, this is about watching the sign, which is Israel. 
This is about watching the things on the earth, which is as the days of Noah, which is what? Love without principles, people mixing with spirits, and, and yeah. we're just watching all this happen now because spiritualism is the fastest growing thing. So when we're coming to this last day, it ain't just about the storms, the signs, and all that. Those are the things that he talked about. This mm -hmm. temple got destroyed just like he prophesied 70 AD. So now as we watch this, you have to understand that this is about his bride. Mm -hmm. His bride will be lifted, called away off this earth, taken to the marriage supper. Now, I was blessed enough in my early life because my heart was so hungry for God and I wanted information. Like I said, I didn't go to Christian college or anything, but God connected me to some rabbis. And I'm going to tell you, one of the deepest things I learned was about Matthew 25, about the wedding. Now, I got personally a chance to sit under and meet Zola Levin. If you don't know who he was, wow. uh, he was one of the most powerful uh, conversions from Orthodox Jew to Christianity. Wow. I mean, that man had understanding that was mind-boggling. Yeah. And he taught us about Matthew 25. And when he explained it, it was like, oh, my God. It was so deep because of the way the Jewish wedding played out was exactly the way that Jesus come and proposed to the disciples. Mm. He went back to the father. The, kid, the sons worked for the son, for the father. They had no idea how much money they had. They couldn't even tell the bride when he was coming back. She would have to wear a veil because that meant she was spoken for. And nobody else could propose to her. And that, so she had to wait, but she had to keep a lamp burning every night because mm -hmm. the tradition was he would come at the edge of the city. See, so he didn't come in the city. Christ's feet don't mm -hmm. sit down, but but he blowed the horn that she knew because she knew now what his horn sounded like, the trumpet. And she ran out to meet him, taking wow. her bridegrooms with him. Okay, so as she went out and met him, they went back to the house where the father and his friends the Father, Heavenly Father, and the Old Testament saints had a wedding prepared. One of the greatest revelations I ever had one night, I was a young Christian, and I learned, I was learning all this. I got down with some of my bed, and I was praying, and the Holy Spirit filled the room, and I asked the Lord. I said, you know, I was telling God, basically, you know, I'm so excited when I get to heaven. I said, you know, and I started listing people in the Old Testament that I wanted to meet. Instantly, the Holy Spirit left the room. Mm -hmm. And I, I repented. I said, God, wow. what did I say? And I sat there, it seemed like forever, because wow. he left the room. I repented and repented. And I said, I'm sorry, what did I say? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so plain. And he said, don't ever say you can't wait to see who is in heaven. He said, all of heaven is waiting on the bride to walk in. Wow. When you walk Man. in. When the bride walks in, everybody wants to know what it was like to be on earth as the bride of Christ. So we've got some work to do, guys, because we're definitely not fulfilling our bride position. You don't want no snaggle tooth bride <laughs> walking in. And we can prove that from Song of Solomon. We found a verse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord help us. All right, guys, it's uh, uh, about 14 after, and I promise everybody, uh, is everybody, is this helping you? Okay, and we're going to continue, uh, you know, just doing uh, a study on, and, and do this for me. Uh, I think everybody here has got my number. If you have a question about the rapture or something was said tonight, just text me, Stephen or Martin one, and, uh, and, and let us know, and then we'll try to address it. If I need to wrap it up on the last night, we'll bring at least uh, the panel back up here. I'm Josh. I'll probably be traveling the country somewhere. But, uh, We're in Ohio for like uh, what, two more weeks, two and a half weeks. Yeah. Okay. We're around. I don't know. He, listen, he, <laughs> he'll be up here dialed we'll in. We'll be back in August. He, him and Amanda, is, uh, they're, they're, they're getting – they're getting Bible studies almost every morning. We're getting into some word and, uh, and it's fun because, you know, we're having a good time. We're getting in the word. Uh, they're staying with us this week and, uh, we're really enjoying that having some good fellowship, but when we're, we're getting in the word. So we we're doing this to help you. I want you to get an understanding about, you know, what the rapture means, uh, who's going to go. Cause not everyone you know, hollers, Lord, Lord is going to enter in. 
Uh, it's and, and you know I was talking to Mike and uh, and some of them before Bible study tonight about you know Hebrews chapter six because one of the the doctrines of Christ is that it mentions there there's five of them and the first one is to repent from dead works. A lot of people don't understand that dead works mm. is whatever you are doing for God that He did not call you to do. Mm. That's dead works. You're not getting credit for it. So there's a lot of people who have absolutely spent their lives like monks and priests and whoever right. are fulfilling positions that are sacrificial. Dead works. That's dead works. Wow. And they need to repent from it. Yeah. And they're going to miss the rapture. And, and I, 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 I'll I, say this. You know, I've got friends who call me um, that outside the state and stuff that I talk to about spiritual things. I get people ask me questions. Some of them don't like it, but I say this. I believe, this is my personal belief, okay? When the rapture takes place, it'll almost go unnoticed. Mm. I do not believe in the, the movie portrayed, left behind, that planes will fall out of the sky and, and everything. I think it'll go almost unnoticed wow. because there'll be that few people wow. yeah. who are ready to go. That's good. Okay, you guys, you got anything to wrap it up? I got one verse I want to give you, Pastor, okay. just before we close. Just... He's not coming after a snaggletooth bride. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, even shorn, which comes up from the washing. Everyone bear twins, and none is barren among them. Song of Solomon 4 and 2. So he got all his teeth. <laughs> They're referring back to a mess I preached a month or so ago when I said he's not coming back for a snaggletooth bride. It's biblical. <laughs> it's biblical. Well, I mean, think about this. You know... <laughs> The creator of the universe, the God who has literally made everything in, the, in our existence, has chosen to send his son to become one of us. And now he wants him a bride. What, what do you think God wants that to That's look good. like? I mean, how come, how come, you know, everybody that's ever been a parent and had children who got married, you know, we, and, and I did the same thing, you know, is this person the right person for mm. my child? Because as a parent, you want them to be happy. Yeah. As a parent, you don't want them to go through, you know, unnecessary pains or trials. And especially you don't want them to bring some heathen <laughs> grandchildren home. <laughs> so, so, you know, good, God buddy. doesn't want any heathen children either. And... And so, you know, I, I believe this is serious. I think it should bring a sense of conviction yeah. on oh, all yeah. of us as we talk about it. That, you know, uh, don't do not do this unprincipled love thing. It's not going to fly. I'm That's telling right. You, it's not going to fly. God's love has principles. Literally. I mean, think about this. If God's love don't have principles, then what's John 3, 16 mean? For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever will, right? Okay, if his love didn't have principles, why didn't he send an angel? Come on. Mm. There it is. Why did he send a son? Woo! Because he sent his best. Yeah. His love has principles. Amen. You know, he could have sent some created being, but no, he sent part of the Godhead. So this is really... I think going to be fun. I want to thank uh, Josh for joining us tonight. I want to uh, uh, go ahead and give him a hand. Come on. I want to thank Martin for doing his part. And uh, Pastor Stephen, give him a hand. All right. Let's give Pastor a hand, too, for being a well of knowledge. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, let's bow.